Okay, welcome to the 34th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Tony Gamage. He is an artist, filmmaker, animator, trainer, and HCPC registered art therapist. He has a particular interest in stories and personal narrative, and in the idea of embodied story making, stories that are made by hand as well as told. This is reflected in his own work, films, artists, books, and installations, but also in his participatory work in prisons, secure units, mental health settings, and centers for asylum seekers. Uh, Tony has made over 30 films with participants in this time. Many of these films have won Coastler Awards and been screened in conferences, symposiums, and in galleries and museums. Welcome, Tony. Hi, hi, Piers. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. yeah, pleasure, pleasure. So I was trying to reflect the first time I came across your work, and I think it, you might have been there. It was 2019 at the uh, boarding school survivors conference and Nick Duffel was speaking and they yeah. played your film. Yeah, I was um, there. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. there, right, okay. I was so, there. Yeah, so I found that really kind of, wow, I think I had brought tears to my eyes because it's such a profound film and we'll play it, you know, further on in the interview. Um, but I'd love you to begin just by sharing a little bit about what drew you into the work you now do. I think, well, I've been making art, you know, since I was a child, uh, as, and that's partly what the film's about. Um, and part of the film is partly about how, on reflection, the sort of making art was a way of surviving for me, the experience of boarding school. Um, I remember making, uh, and I used to be really into Alice Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I remember doing a painting of Alice Cooper hanging, yeah. which, you know, I didn't understand the metaphor then, but um, I remember my art teacher was quite struck by it. Um, it was very gory, um, but I kind of, the, it, it was a sort of perfect metaphor now of the cutting off the head from the body. Um, so, and I, the yeah, end, I went to art school um, and I think I realised quite quickly I wasn't, really I, I used to teach in a school um which wasn't i didn't get on with very well um and i think and i think it was partly because it was about make you know the idea of making art in a school is to become good at art um, it's not to express things it's not to express things that are difficult and i think i didn't particularly know it know it at the time but that was my interest and so eventually became an art therapist um and worked in the NHS in our mental health settings for a long time. Yeah. Um, but even then I didn't feel quite that that was quite right. Um, and also I suppose working in a big institution like the NHS, mm. um, I'm not very good at working in big institutions. And I think that's probably because I was, I started life in one. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't a good experience. So eventually I, I kind of went away and learned to do animation and um, I saw a, some animation films in, when I lived in London many, many years ago um, and it was like it kind of a light bulb moment really, an epiphany. But it was many years later that I, I learned to do it myself when technology caught up with, it was very difficult, it wasn't very accessible at that point. Technology sort of caught up and I started to make my own films and then I did a project in a secure unit. Um, I'd never worked in a secure unit before. I, I sort of um, I did my first project there, and luckily it was really because it went really well. So I've been kind of going since then doing that, and I suppose my my experience and knowledge and the theories kind of come from the ground up from just doing it really. Um, even though I was an art therapist at that point, but. Um, so that's a kind of, that's a sort of career plotted history, if that's what, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I was reading your, um, the, the, the forms you sent through the, the pages and you're chapters. sharing the, you know, the chapters and the experiences of working in the secure units and how people had really changed. And yeah, it really touched me that 
people were able to share their stories through animation in a way that maybe they'd never been able to before um, and in, you know but in a positive way rather than this negative yeah way, you know um, I think that that really touched me um, I'm aware that I've unplugged my microphone so I am just going to plug in my other microphone I would love you to speak at the moment about um, art therapy, please. Okay. And just, you know, as I was sharing before we began, for me, the um, my own healing journey from boarding school and the trauma, I spent quite a few years just painting every single day. And I was working with a Jungian analyst and she i was just doing black and white and she said one day piers have you thought about you know painting in color and i'm like no no i want to i want to get the black and white sorted first <laughs> and she's like i really do recommend you doing color i'm like okay go on then so i did and she's like wow that's amazing and that began my journey so yeah i'd love you to share a little bit about um art therapy please tony what kind of what the hell is it yeah, yeah. what is it and and how does it help us well, I mean, there's two questions in there. You know, there's a number of questions in there. There's, you know, art, what art therapy is, which is something quite specific, and how art helps us, I think, because I think it's not just art therapy that helps us, as you, you know, you indicated. So art therapy is, is it's, um, it's a state registered profession. So, um, or the arts therapies, because it's not just art, it's art, music, drama and dance and movement. So I kind of got an interest in across the board in a way, so some sort of cause particularly drama therapy. Um, but it, it, it gives people an opportunity to to explore um, their life experiences, their experiences, their everyday experiences in images or sounds or movement um, in stories and drama um as a way i suppose of being able to try and make sense of um their experiences um to tell a story to tell their to talk of their experiences that in a symbolic way in a metaphorical way so that there's a kind of a distance so it kind of provides some safety so there's a massive difference of someone um make some art and it might be about their experiences rather than in an assessment where they talk about their experiences. Mm. Um, it's a sort of very different thing. Um, so yeah, there's, um, I mean, I could, I think there's also something about, uh, there's something about making art, um, especially if you're doing it in a group. So I work with, um, a charity called Art Refuge and we work with refugees mm -hmm. and they've got what's called the community table kind of model yeah. and so there's a sort of table and there's lots of art materials mm -hmm. all sorts of things typewriters brick little sort of toy bricks um, not that many traditional art materials actually um, all sorts of things plasticine um, and in a way what happens is people just talk and, and they have different conversations around the table. Um, to where if, if you were sat at the table talking, it'd be a different conversation, but if people are making it at the same time, again, it provides a kind of safety, a sort of distance. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's things, so, so, something like that really. Um, I was going to say something else. This slightly escaped my mind, but I might come back to it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I, things escape my I'm mind. I think there's the also, uh, yeah, art making, this is it. It's a physical activity, mm. as you said. It, it, it's um, So you tell a slightly different story. And I know we're going to talk about stories later, an embodied narrative, as, as I call it. Mm. I don't know if that's an actual term. Mm. But so, uh, you know, for people who might not have the words to talk about their experience um it's a really useful thing i mean what it's not though is you know i think probably I don't think any art therapist will go right okay why don't you pay, 
paint what you're feeling because that, that it's that just doesn't really work that you know it's too prescriptive it's and if someone said that to me i'd go blank i wouldn't know what they were talking about um so we kind of keep it quite open and flexible yeah. and see what emerges um yeah. and i don't think art therapy is a sort of i think it's a a, a fallacy i don't think it's still a fallacy that that the art therapist will then interpret your painting that doesn't that's not what art therapy is particularly okay. because that's a kind of a sort of it's like an imposing an interpretation yeah. of something yeah. um so it's much more kind of organic than that mm -hmm. thank you that's really powerful because i i found whether that was at boarding school or you know this idea of creativity is that like the left and right hemispheres of the brain always seen creativity in the right side of the brain mm. and this idea that it can't be marked it can't be analyzed it just has to be an open space that oh i just create something what does it mean it's like i have no idea <laughs> it's powerful because it's ambiguous yeah with words they have a much they might have much less ambiguity unless it's poetry or something like that but um you know words are much more literal Mm, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. images and even stories are you know, slightly less so mm. open to interpretation and to fictionalization you know and i think that's important yeah and interesting i I've, I've often found that with my if i've been showing people my paintings they would have very different interpretations same painting but the same person will have a very similar interpretation for all my paintings so it's almost like it's whatever their internal lens is, is exactly. what they, they will see. So one therapist will see something very different from another. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. So I think, you know, one of the, the, the next question I really had was around boarding school. Yeah. So one of the things I found working with boarding school men and I've heard Nick Duffel talk about this as well, this idea of the importance of sharing our stories. So, you know, what in your opinion is this importance of storytelling and especially with something like a complex trauma, like childhood trauma? Yeah. I mean, important question. There's a quote by um, somebody called um, Stephen Gross he wrote a book called an examined life yeah, and he yeah. said something along the lines of if you can't find a way of telling your story your story tells you yeah so there's something about by telling your story or making your story mm -hmm. um you're kind of, t sort of taking some responsibility for it mm -hmm. and taking control of it really mm -hmm. i mean a lot of people that i work with uh, you know anyone who's had something done to them so if you're sent to go to boarding school that's your story telling you you haven't got any control or power over that mm -hmm. um, and people in secure units in prisons um, have got very little autonomy and very little sort of say in what their story has been you know they've been through the court system um, or they might have a mental health diagnosis um, it's just another kind of imposed narrative and imposed story um mm. so i think there's something very powerful about people beginning to own their story and to tell it in their own way um and it sort of it's it works staggeringly well mm. um people who've never told their story before i work with this guy on a secure unit someone says almost when i first started doing this work many years ago and um he came up to me, I went for a meeting and I said, this is what I'm going to do an animation project if anyone wants to get involved. Um, I said, you can make any, you can make a film, any, anything you like, you can make it about anything you like, which is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not saying we're going to make a film about mental health or recovery or something like that. Um, I said, you can make about anything. And he came up and said, oh, I've got 20 years of suffering. You can make, oh, you, you, we can make a film out. And he turned out he'd been a boy soldier in Somalia and um and come over, eventually come over to this country and had a breakdown and committed a very serious offense um but no one on the in the hospital knew anything about this he hadn't told the story before he'd been in the system for years and hadn't thought 
or hadn't found a way of telling a story. So I found that really, it really opened my eyes that. And I think at that point, and I did another project on a women's ward, which was quite an experience. Um, and I suddenly, I kind of felt, actually I'm getting people to tell their stories. Um, and this seems to be what people want to do. Um, maybe it'd be a good idea if I told mine really. So I think, so at that point I hadn't thought of doing autobiographical, even though I had been unconsciously. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So coming back to this Somali... I can't totally remember what the question was, actually. Sorry. It was just, no, it was more to do with, like, boarding school, the importance of telling our stories and what happens when we tell our stories. That's right. Yeah, sorry, I went off piece a bit. Yeah. Um, well, I think to come back to what I said, it's, it's things being done to you and mm. having no autonomy or control. Um and there's something about telling your stories, you begin to dialogue with mm. your your experience. Because the thing about boarding school, as you would know from talking to all the other people, mm. the problem with it is it's so normalised. Yeah, It's not seen as a trauma. Mm. And I think as soon as you start to tell that story, you, you kind of, you start to challenge that. Mm. It's a way of reflecting on it. And you go, oh my God, no, that's that. You know, you have a, you have, you might have a narrative in your head, the kind of meta narrative that you've been told to yourself. It's an imposed story, but when you start telling it, and particularly when you make it with animation, you're making things. You know, things start to emerge that you might not remember. And you kind of start to remember things, but it's not in a traumatizing way, not in a reach a triggering way. Yeah, because you're kind of controlling it yeah 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 thank you thank and also you know it's also people need it's like people have been abused and obviously many people have been abused went to boarding school there's something about people hearing it and validating it which is really really important mm. what's the power you found so one of people telling their stories but then of other people who have been traumatized hearing the story What's the, what's the impact? Because I've seen that in my own work. What, what have you found in your own work? When someone who's told their story, they've made their film and someone else has watched it, what's been the impact there? Well, if it's someone who's had similar experience and they found it um, helpful, mm -hmm. it, again, it's validating. It's, I'm not mad. I'm not making a fuss about nothing. You know, that's so important. The danger is, is that someone might go, you're making a bit of a fuss about that, or you're going on about it. You know, so there's a danger to it, that people who are in denial of the trauma, you know, that's the, the risk that we take, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's, I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's opened up a can of worms, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and once you open the can, you can't really get them back in. Uh, but I, it, it's, it's, I'm so glad I've done it, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. and I think particularly when people like well, Suzanne Zadik, who, you, you know, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's something about her response to it was quite overwhelming. Mm -hmm. There's something, something about someone who hadn't been to boarding school and wasn't in the English system at all. She's American. Um, and just putting it in, contextualizing it in terms of adverse childhood experiences. Um, I found that really powerful and very, very moving. It's a little life changing, really. Yeah. And I get, you know, I get the odd email from someone saying, you know, how effective they've been and they're talking a little bit about their experiences. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think that thing of normalization, I noticed, I think it was when I first began on my therapeutic journey, it was 20 years ago, I, I'd written a story of uh, a poem at boarding school and I read it to my therapist and she burst into tears and I was like, oh, you know, it's that normalization that, well, this happened to everyone, <laughs> yeah. but obviously not, not anyone who wasn't at boarding school or separated in that way. Um, and yeah, yeah. And like you say, I, I found that 
this idea that when I shared my story or someone else shares their story, especially in a group of ex-boarders, because we, we don't share. Mm -hmm. For the first time, people have gone, oh, my God, I'm not alone. Yeah. And, and I think that's been the common misperception of ex-boarders or traumatized people who've been traumatized in childhood is that I'm, it's only me. It's only me who's, who's messed up or I've been through this and actually to realize that no, there's lots, lots of us. Yeah. I mean, we're trained not to make a fuss about it. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. dangerous to yeah. feel anything yeah 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 i mean feelings yeah yeah kind of the subject for the, the next men's circle that i do with the board, a boarding school group is around um this idea of homosexuality but also what stemmed out of that that anything that was feminine weak uh touchy you know sensitive vulnerable it was all in my school it was all called well you're homosexual you're gay mm -hmm. um and yeah. you know yeah. feeling it's like well no that's just a natural part of being human yeah well i came from a family where i had three older sisters yeah, yeah. um and they all went off to the same school and uh -huh. i went off alone to mine but yeah. i came from a kind of matriarch a kind of a, a female environment mm -hmm. um and then was thrust into this very very male world so was, that was quite a shock yeah um yeah yeah but maybe a kind of i kind of could hold on to the sort of feminine and i suppose again that's where art was really useful for me you know there's a kind of did you manage to is that where you began your art and and doing that i think so yeah I, 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 prep school particularly yeah um then when I went to the public school, less so, but I picked it up at A-level. Mm, mm. And that, again, it really saved me because there was a, the art room, you could you could sort of shut, it was a whole different world. Mm, mm. Like-minded people. And that was a real saving grace, I mm. think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Sounds like it must have been lovely to be able to get away. Yeah. And you could go there at night and lock the door and you know, there's blackout curtains. So you could, um, you know, you could go be there all night if you wanted. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I was very into art. My mother's an artist. and But when I went to school, it was like I suppressed all of that. Um, yeah. It was only I only started painting when I started to have a breakdown in my 20s and my therapist had start to paint um in color and that's when the creativity came back again i'd written poetry at school that had been my way but it'd been quite measured it's got to be written yeah. a certain way it wasn't from my heart it was from my head and as i started to paint later on i just found it so healing i loved the color like doing abstract so um and i was, was going to say earlier about the paint you know because i used to paint that's what i started off doing was painting mm -hmm. and there's something about the kind of physicality of it that yeah. it's a material it's a sort of and it, i was thinking i've been thinking and i've sort of talked about it and sort of about home about this idea of home and i've never thought about it particularly yeah. Um, yeah. even though you know it's more about the absence of it but I kind of almost wondered at sort of something about making art and this the physicality is almost like a home. It's a kind of it's a kind of regulating thing. You've got this material that's mm. tactile and aesthetic and you know, it doesn't have any particular meaning really. It's a kind of thing that's it's a comfort in a funny kind of a way. I don't know if you found that. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting that one of the I think it's in one of these books uh, by uh, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. Uh, one's a um, more an anthropologist, the other's a Jungian analyst. And they talk yeah, about the idea of um, the archetypes and the lover. And I kind of in there, there's a, 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 a passage which talks about art. And he's saying that when we kind of connect in with art, it's almost like we can go into the pre-verbal. So if we struggle to yeah. remember stuff, 
just by painting and the images and there was this cobra group in the 50s which came out of germany and belgium i think possibly holland and they did this very much the childlike painting and i really got into that in the in the monastery uh, for a period of time and what they're saying in this book the lover within is that you can access those parts of yourself which were pre-verbal mm, therefore bring that healing yeah. Yeah. um so i found i i struggled to 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 paint with uh paint brushes uh or or draw because i had such a, a strong negative inner critic that i would draw something like a a, a car and it'd be like that's not an effing car that the inner voice would come in so the only way i was able to do the painting was to do abstract and then if it looked like nothing i'd say well i'm not trying to paint anything and that seemed to kind yeah, of placate right. my inner yeah. critic yeah so yeah yeah by doing that i think that idea of home what you're saying actually really modeling and uh, and using the paint in that way i just found it oh incredibly yeah. powerful mainly to access my anger because i was so angry but under the anger then very quickly came the tears and a, a huge amount of uh, of uh, grief and sadness mm -hmm. so yes i found it very powerful mm so yeah yeah what about yourself you know using kind of say actual materials because that was one of my questions because you know the idea of home or its loss um and also in contrast the hostile environment and that idea so would you say that's kind of linked in in the same way using those materials I think the hostile environment thing is a slightly separate thing, okay. uh, but it, it, it's sort of connected, um, which I, you know, want to come to. I think with, with materials for me, uh, you know, there's a kind of, yeah, I used to be a painter, I used to paint, but then I sort of moved away from that. Um, and I kind of make things now to animate, you know, like puppets and things like that. Okay. Um, and there's something I love. I really like making things and they're not very good. I'm not, I'm not, you know, not massively talented. I'm not kind of one of those people who can pick up a pencil and make an amazing thing. Mm. I kind of, I've got my skills and talents, but I've been doing it for like however many 40 years, isn't it? Um, but there's there is something about making stuff and doing 3d stuff and there's sort of the clay and the sort of, and it's, and um, there's, your hands have got a memory. Your hand knows what it's doing sometimes in a way that you don't, it kind of circumvents your brain um, or the kind of rational bit of the brain, the kind of the linear bit of the brain. Um, and so access is something slightly different and it tells a slightly different story. Um, but I kind of, yeah, I think there's something about the, the material and the kind of, that for me, whatever it is, whether it's clay or plasticine or papier mache or paint or sort of 35, I've worked with film and stuff like that. So, you know, analog film, um, I just get excited about it, you know, and in a way that it's un very uncomplicated. Mm. And I think the kind of hostile environment thing is a complicated thing isn't it it's complex and i yeah. also our environment came out because i've been thinking about the idea of home um and for this piece of work that's coming up and i was with the theme of home and i didn't thought i was struck struck that i'd never th thought of my work as being about home um even though there's a line in my film saying you know um something about arriving at my new home which was the hostile environment which is the school boarding mm -hmm. school but there's a kind of political thing I was thinking in terms of my work with refugees and and um, and politically, you know, as you know, that there's a huge percentage of people in the cabinet who went to boarding school, mm. um, way more than the, the average yeah, um, in yeah. the population. It's like kind of 2% of people went to private school in a population, mm. um, that alone boarding school. Um, and it's like a sort of half the cabinet or something went, go, went to boarding school, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. I think know, it's... And so we're very used to hostile environments and mm -hmm. to them hostile environments are normal. Um, 
and I just it's just a link that I've made really um and how that you know people in pr prisons are massively hostile environments they're really awful but that it's not that the prisons make them that it's 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 from above it's 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 a governmental decision um and the same with the, the home office's treatment of refugees you know it's it's a conscious thing to create a hostile environment you know that's what they've gone out to do to dissuade you know in the, to rationalize to dissuade people from coming over to the uk it doesn't work um yeah because yeah wow yeah that's great uh, great perspective it reminds me of what nick duffel talks about the inner indigenous and the right. idea okay. that what the british were really good at doing was killing suppressing that inner indigenous that beautiful spirit amazing inner part of ourselves you know we became great the british is going in not with through violence or force but kind of suppressing the inner child in the whichever country we went into which kind of sounds like what you're saying there is we're doing the same thing in the home office or in the prisons because i i heard uh, someone talking about prisons in denmark who said at maximum security there are no gates or fences mm. it's just... a much lower reoffending rate exactly they're treated like humans rather than what we do is we treat them like you know animals and it doesn't work it's not rational mm. that's the that's the interesting thing it's not like they're saying but this works yeah. so at least they're but you know according to their own figures it doesn't work so it, it's a, it's totally logical it's it's a kind of it's a traumatized decision it's a decision that comes from trauma mm -hmm. um i believe you know my, you know yeah and I, I second it <laughs> and of course yeah you know, for me going into prisons is like kind of it's a challenge because it's mm -hmm it's it's a kind of there is obviously a look-alike I, th I think people bulk of that idea that you know prisons and boarding schools are, are mm. alike but i'd probably say boarding schools are slightly worse but um ones i've been in anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh, stephen fry reading his autobiography and him saying you know boarding uh prison wasn't too difficult for him because he'd already been to boarding school yeah i don't get that i, th I that's one of my worst fears is having to go to prison just because because okay. i've been to boarding school and i uh, and i kind of been into prisons as well i would not want to not be able to get out at the end of the day <laughs> that's okay. kind of yeah 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 interesting yeah i don't think yeah but i didn't when i first started working in a prison um I hadn't made the link. Um, it wasn't that long ago, maybe like eight, seven or eight years ago. Um, I just the, the the day, the night before I was going to the prison, um, I couldn't get to sleep. I couldn't sleep the whole night. I was so anxious, and it kind of I eventually the sort of penny dropped in a way, and it was like, oh god, this is a bit like when I first went to school, and I couldn't sleep there because I was so terrified. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I'm interested in how we find ourselves doing the work that we do. Mm. Yeah, that was kind of another question, you know, number six is, you know, how do our early experiences sh often shape our careers? Mm. Well, I, yeah, I think it's... um. It's no accident, you know. When I when I first started work, when I did a first project in a medium secure unit, which is it's a locked unit and for people who have committed offences, but it's very di it's a hospital, not a prison, so very different. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was something about it, and I completely loved it. I completely loved it, and it's like, oh god, this is what I'm meant to do. You know, this is it's a light bulb thing, an epiphany, really. Um, I've, and I felt a massive kind of empathy for the people who are inside, really. I kind of found I could kind of get on with them okay. And I kind of seemed to know on a sort of intuitive level what they kind of needed in, not always, but, you know, 
which mostly it's just treating people with respect and you know and um which is what they don't get particularly from the authorities but um that works kind of quite well really <laughs> it's, it's fairly easy it's fairly straightforward and easy but so yeah um and then with refugees as well, it, again, it wasn't a conscious thing, but there was something I knew I was drawn to it. I was kind of horrified at what our government was doing. Um, and so, but I think it was deeper than that. There was something about people losing their home, their country, everything. And again, there's a mirroring. It is different. It's very, very different, but there's a, there is a echo, however small. Mm -hmm. And as you've done the healing, so the last seven, eight years, and you've started to explore that within yourself, have you found yourself changing or something's changed? Slowly. <laughs> it's, it's slowly, yeah, yeah. I can't say um, I, I still don't get tripped up or, you know, suddenly mm -hmm. I'm sort of in something and it's like, oh, right, how did I get here? <laughs> um, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I know this. Um, yeah, I mean, what I've... I think I started to see a particular therapist. She was a body psychotherapist and a right. um, somatic experiencer and, and also worked with parts. And I found that model really, really helpful. And mm. um, yeah, there's something about beginning to have empathy for that in, for yourself, really, where that's sort of massive, you know, so they're kind of challenging the sort of the self-hatred. And that sense of failure, um, I think that's how that's changed for me, really. Um, yeah, yeah. And because, has... you know, however successful my work is, and it, it has been quite successful. I mean, sometimes it's feast or famine my work, I'm a freelance, but, you know, I've created something that not really anyone does, hardly anybody anyway. And, um, yeah. And it really works and people mm. are very interested in it but still i'll find a way of sort of thinking of you know failed in some way and i think that's a hangover from boarding school oh yeah i can really resonate myself the failure i just saw myself as a failure it was only probably two years ago that i started to challenge that and i found my way of doing it was i would try something out and then I wouldn't I'd get one rejection and I'd move to the next thing it's like oh, I'm a failure there so I'd move to the next and I'd just go around in circles until I'd do six different things and I'd come back to the first oh I'm gonna try this again and mm. it was my wife really and she's just like Piers and then I did you know I did some kind of work through the the tools I use and it's like right I'm gonna challenge this I'm a failure and once I worked on that and then it was like oh you know and then that started to shift but i can totally resonate with the failure mm. um uh, uh thing well, also we're set up to you know if we if we haven't got a job in the city or got a cabinet position mm -hmm. um you, you almost can automatically feel like a failure we're not earning 100 mm -hmm. grand a year mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that's what we've been trained to do you know well um, so yeah. However, and we consciously we rebel. Um, it's still, you know, it's sort of it's deep within, isn't it? And mm -hmm. that goes back. And I was just thinking. I was just thinking. And I know I'm jumping around a bit, but that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about this thing about having empathy for oneself, mm -hmm. sort of the child parts, um, and that's something I hadn't until not relatively recently, and we heard about. But I'm just aware that there's a couple of people I work with, um, people with a borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like that diagnosis or term, but mm -hmm. um, it was a it was a day centre for, for people with that. And a couple of met, women made these extraordinary films. One by Irene, who made a film about um, being sexually abused from the age of six by her father. And it was an extraordinary film. It's an extraordinary experience. It's a life-changing experience for me, you know. I think for her as well. Um, I suspect I got more out of it than her, but, you know, still. Um, but at one point, she so she made this little plasticine puppet of herself, a tiny little thing. 
And we were talking, we did, I do an evaluation at the end of every project, and I was saying, well, how was your film? How did it work out for you? What do you think of your film? And she was holding, like in her hand, this puppet of herself. And she's, as she's talking about it, and she's, it's very embodied language, she's saying, well, I've, you know, through making the film, I've given back the scars that my parents back, gave me back to them. Such an embodied thing to do, I go, you know, and as she's saying it, she's stroking this puppet of herself as a child. Mm. And yeah, so, and then the other film by Lauren who made a film about shame called The Shame Monster. Mm. And it's this brutal film about how much she hates herself, how much she's rubbish. And, but at the end, she kind of, there's some resolution. And we're, I think we're wondering how it's going to end the film. And, and the, the little puppet of herself, her hand comes in and the little puppet of herself walks into her hand and crawls in there, nestles in her hand. And again, I hadn't heard of the sort of child part kind of work, particularly at no. that point, but it's that, isn't it? And mm -hmm. so, so there's something about learning from the people I've worked with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, thank you for sharing those stories. That really touches me. I've, I found that reading, you know, your chapters, it was like, whoa, what powerful stories. I, I went off to a workshop a couple of weeks ago um, with one of my guests, uh, Michael Maisie, who, who works with the CIP project with recovering alcoholics or trauma survivors. Mm. And hearing people's stories, it's like, oh, I just I was in tears. It's so powerful that what they've been through and then to come out the other side. Uh, and Storytelling so. is, is a humanizing. Yeah. It's humanizing, isn't it? It, it is. And I think what comes to me is that as an ex border, I often put people on pedestals or I put people as less than me. And as soon as I hear their story, they're human again. And it's yeah. like, Oh, thank you. I, 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 you know, I take you from your ivory tower. I take you from the pit. And when I share my story, they do the same. It's like, yeah. you know, in that weekend with these recovering alcoholics, uh, I was sharing my story of boarding school and sharing growing up with an alcoholic father. And so many of them said, oh, I can so relate to your story. And I felt like an imposter because, you know, I wasn't an addict. And they were like, no, 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 I really can relate. So, yeah, um, yeah, that, thank so you. It's connecting as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's like human, humanize. It's like, oh, you're a human, you hurt like I did. Yeah, yeah, so. and, and I think so many of the, the, the hostile environment is the opposite. Yeah. It's dehumanizing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what, do you, I'd love to move in and play a bit of your film in a second, but I'd love to maybe brainstorm a bit or well, how do we break this hostile environment and bring more love compassion in to our governments into the home office into the prison system god that's a big question i think it's very easy to lose hope and to and to kind of get cynical and very angry and i think I think I was trying to remind myself that the people that make these decisions are traumatized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're making the decision from there. So it kind of contextualizes that they're not evil. They're, they're just, they've sort of locked away the kind of human bit of them. And I'm sure it comes out at times, but, um, but the kind of the, the culture, it's a culture as well, isn't it? It's, it's not even about individuals. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's kind of what we're doing, really, or, what, you know, I, I, I can't think of I, This is what I do. You know, I think mm -hmm. however small it might seem, uh, this is what we do. This is what I do. So going into a prison and so I work with this guy called Gary. Um, he'd never told his story before. He was he was in for a very, very, very violent crime. You know, it was kind of a murder, um, a bit extreme. Um, and he said, I want to make a film about my story, about my life. And he'd been in and out of foster homes. He'd found his mum dead from a heroin overdose. Again, he'd never 
talked about that before. He made a film about it. And and then these films, they're going to get used for training. It's training. We need, prisons need to be trauma-informed. Mm-hmm. They're not. Mm-hmm. You know, they need to be. So it's, just, it's incremental, though, mm-hmm. how we change this system. I th- there was a great, um, I don't know if you know, the Nick Cave Red Hand Files. I've, I used to love Nick Cave when I was young. You I know love he... Nick, the Red Hand Files are amazing. Right. And people write him a letter, ask him a question, and he writes this beautiful letter back, and they're published. You know, there's a website. And someone wrote to him about cynicism recently, um, about how to, how the dangers of cyn- You know, I'm worried of, I'm coming too cynical. As we can, as we can all relate to, really in this world, and he this very beautiful letter back saying, "Yeah, you're right to be worried because it's really dangerous. It's very easy to be cynical. It doesn't require any effort, and it's really destructive. It's much more difficult to be hopeful, and much more radical, and that takes work to be hopeful. So it's along those lines, and I think the work that you do, the work that I try and do, is about hope." It's mm. about, you know, and it's, I'm about to start a project in a women's prison. And it's kind of like that, really, the kind of, and I've, I said to the kind of commission, I said, well, if we get a film out of this, it will be a miracle, but we will. We'll almost mm. certainly, we'll, not almost certainly, but we will get a film out of it because I will, I'm determined. But mm. it's a miracle that this sort of, the sort of, the challenges that this person, the people that I work with have faced in their life and how, cut off from themselves they are how wounded they are that they manage to tell a story to tell their story if they're given the opportunity and it's sort of it does you know it is life-changing but it's not magic yeah 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 i think i love what judith herman talks about in her book trauma and recovery Mm. is that for her through trauma we'll always be in recovery And I think that's quite useful because some of us believe in this golden pill that I'll have this, I'll do this, and then that'll be it. Whereas I see for me, I'm a work in progress that, oh, I messed up again. Oh, (laughs) and it's nice as I can relax now. I'm just myself. I'm a bit, (laughs) you know, strange at times. It doesn't get rid of the trauma. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the story's still there. you're a bit more in control of it yeah yeah i'd say (laughs) never totally yeah yeah i'd say you know uh you know i guess that's part of my fascination is how we heal it's like uh, a couple of podcasts ago i was speaking to dawson church who works a lot with ptsd um people coming back from afghanistan and iraq um and he's found using eft emotional freedom technique top tapping that's really helped um a lot of them coming back so that's something i'm really fascinated by is these new uh, bands of science or therapies it's like well let's try this out does this work on me oh yeah that's quite good oh no that doesn't work (laughs) And, and, and seeing so so i realize we're probably we've been speaking almost three quarters of an hour so i'd love you know for us to play a little bit of one of your animations which i first saw um you know at the the boarding school uh syndrome workshop uh boarding school survivors workshop in 2019 so um i will just put it on so just to before we do if you'd like to give a little bit of context what the film is about the film's called Norton Grimm and Me. Norton Grimm is a kind of alter ego that sort of been with me most of my life. Is a bit of a char- little character. He he looks a bit sort of cross between a kind of African mudman and a schoolboy in shorts. He's very weak and vulnerable, but, but self harms a lot. Mm-hmm. So he's very violent, self violence. Um, the film is it starts with this idea of being abducted. Um, I, I wanted to be a bit provocative and so I was abducted when I was a child and then it turns out I was abducted by my parents uh, who sent me away so and then I took so I think the bit that we're going to play is sort of it 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 
it's it's a work in progress itself as well. Um, so it's it, it's it starts with how I was abducted, sort of metaphorically, and then goes into what happened next. Well, thank you for the courage and sharing this. It's a very powerful film. So let me um, share my screen. It says. I will stop share because I need to put the audio in. Share sound. My mouth was gabbarded, my hands tied behind my back. is the wrong word. Maybe a bit dramatic. For starters, it was not me put in the boot, but my trunk. With all of my clothes in it. My pants, white shirts, grey socks, blazer, cap, even a kilt, handkerchiefs, to not cry in and shorts, not long trousers. I didn't need to be gagged or trussed up in rope and blankets. I didn't scream, pound my fists, object or even cry. I haven't actually since. It was far more English than that. Buttoned up, motion shut away, desperate polite and, and strangely awkward. I went, if not willingly, then certainly meekly. I didn't put up a fight or even argue against it, even though every bone in my body did not want to go. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. You did say it mean to go on to about five minutes? Yeah, yeah, that's about right, because it goes into the whole stuff around the generations of yeah. trauma and of wow. being sent to boarding school. So that first yeah. minute's very powerful. That uh it's like, ooh, this is like a nightmare. <laughs> I wanted to yeah, I wanted to that's the thing. Again, by doing that, it, I could kind of I go, I want it to look like a horror film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a kind of, it's a sort of style, you know, you can think about and, and I've got it in my head and I want to exaggerate it. So, it, and it, you never get, it's, 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 it's never going to be the same, but mm -hmm. it's all about pointing to it, mm -hmm. pointing to something, pointing to an experience. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I, I really 
when I first saw that, it's like, whoa, that's yeah, very, very powerful. And it's interesting. It's like, how did you find that the telling of it? Did that change anything within you? Or yeah, I think you start to dialogue, you know, that you start to kind of work out how you're going to do this bit. Yeah, okay, I've got, you write it. Well, I, I, well, I, I sometimes I'll make it and write it and, you know, but the narrative I have to, the voiceover I have to write and, and that changes as I'm making it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the kind of, there's something about, you know, embodied narrative, you know, it's, it's, it's a story making mm-hmm. is that if I'd written that story, if I'd written that experience, it would be a different story to making it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. your hands tell a slightly different story because you're making things and mm. and then the kind of it's an unfolding process animation um, one thing leads to another it's not linear it's not um, you don't do the bit first and then you can you don't do it chronologically um, so I don't know how it's changed me. I don't, you know, it's sort of, I'm still doing it. I'm still quite, not quite happy with the abduction bit. Some the bits I showed you with the clothes going to the trunk, I'm happy with that. I don't want to change that. But the kind of abduction bit, I can't quite get it. So it's kind of like there's something still there I'm trying to um, to Mm. pick away at. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I noticed, I think you've added in words as well, which I, um which i don't think were there before but i might be wrong like no yeah no, i probably changed it probably changed quite a lot okay uh, yeah <laughs> never, never satisfied yeah yeah i have that with my paintings i find you know i'll paint and then i've, I've learned now that i have to leave my canvases and go up because I, I have them up in the air yeah, they need distance don't they and yeah i'll come downstairs and some of my canvases will take you know i think four or five years I just keep layering upon layering till I get, oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but if I, I find if I, if I stay on a painting, like on one session, it just becomes a mess because it's kind of layers upon layers upon layers. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think we've probably got about another 10 minutes left. So there's a couple of bits here. Yeah, question nine I've got is, you know, can you share some of the healing that has happened in these environments as people have had permission to share their stories and maybe in your own life or, you know. Um, um, so I'm thinking of examples. I mentioned Irene. Mm-hmm. Um, who um, told us to have been sexually abused. Mm-hmm. Um, from the age of six to, to when she was 16. Um, she'd done quite a lot of therapy previous to the project, so that helped quite a lot. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think there was something that about kind of embodying the, the experience and changing the story. There's something about this work that sort of... I can change and I think that's what I haven't done in this film yet I haven't quite changed it I haven't I'm gonna I think it's gonna move more into a kind of fantasy realm I'm very interested in superheroes not in a traditional way but when working with refugees a lot of them they're very interested in superheroes but they kind of bring that in and superheroes come from a kind of Jewish past in terms of being in hopeless situations like the Holocaust and so, so, so there's a really interesting so I think I'm going to take it in that direction. But Irene, sorry, I'm jumping around quite a lot. Irene, I think she was very, very proud of the film. She died some years ago now, but um, she said that she stopped self-harming after making that film. Oh, Something literally like giving the scars back to her parents, mm. metaphorically, because obviously she didn't literally do that. Mm. Um, so Irene is that, I think the guy from Somalia, the boy soldier, you know, he talked about his story, you know, he, he, he at last people knew and un- could begin to understand why he committed the offences that he had, which is very typical of boy soldiers. 
um so that they could so that i mean that's it's it's a kind of it's it's a big thing really um i work with a, another woman called kerry in a women's secure unit who made a film that was largely fictional but she kind of put in some very clever truths in it i.e um the baddie yeah. in the film was called tony davidson and that's a a, a kind of it's it's the two people that abused her was one was called Tony and his son David, Tony David's son. <laughs> yeah, and um, she kind of got her revenge on them, mm -hmm. and so she then from doing the film again she would have had other treatments and therapies. She went on and did a theatre design course, and the last I heard from her, she was running animation projects um, with looked after children. Right. So there's sort of things like that, really. But, you know, it's, it's as I said before, it's very incremental, this kind of thing. You know, you can't unravel years and years of very extreme trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful with Irene. That's an amazing story. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank I can you. put the link of her film. Um, mm. send it to you, if you want yeah, to. please do, and I'll put it into the description. I'll yeah. put in your. She your... was very keen for people to see her film. Yeah, she yeah, was... yeah. I've watched a few of your films in the last week. Um, I'm not sure if I've already seen hers, but um, yeah, I've found. I yeah, I can't, <laughs> can't, can't remember which ones I have seen. Um, so great, yeah, that'd be wonderful. So I guess, yeah, kind of tying this up really is any last words, you know, how do people find out more about you and yeah, anything you want to share with people who are thinking, actually, maybe I could do something like that, make a film or write a story. What would you say to them? Mm, I think they should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got a website. You, you'll put that on the link and I do when I've got time I run training courses uh, you know part some for, for artists but also non-artists and you know, mostly perfect you know arts therapists and things but I kind of I suppose what I, the way I'd like this work to develop is is I'd really like to work with people who've been to boarding school mm -hmm. and to make a film I'd really like that I don't quite know how to do it yet in terms of it's sort of logistically, practically, but um, there's sort of like getting my own distance from it. But I, you know, I think it would work really well. So that's something that a long term plan. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think people should find their own way of telling their story, though, definitely. And it doesn't need to be true, it, they can fictionalize it, but it, it's really important they tell their story because it's it's an asset it's it's gold you know it as you know it's a kind of alchemical thing really and you know in a way that the best thing that's come out of a horrible experience of boarding school is that i've learned so much about myself i can work i can turn sort of trauma into this kind of gold i'm not sure you know it was worth going to boarding school for but you know it's 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 certainly a, a compensation of sorts yeah yeah. I was just looking through my notes, see if there's anything I kind of plan to say, but I don't think so. Mm. There was, I was, I, I don't know if you've read the red, um, Shaggy Bane. No, oh. no, the red Shaggy, Shaggy Bane, no. Shaggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. He won the Booker Prize possibly two years ago, mm. set in a kind of the housing estates of Glasgow, um, about a boy called Shaggy Bane who, um, who has to look after his alcohol, alcoholic mother mm. and the kind of the trauma that he was put through and it was it was based on his own life mm. and um he said in into your soul he said i i chose to fictionalize the story so that i could take control of it because i didn't have any control when i was a boy so by fictionalizing it, I could take control of it. And I could control the characters. Okay. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Mm. So you. it's kind of very much my ethos. And 
Mm, mm, yeah. mm. Mm, thank you. So that's the one way to take control of the story. That's what I'd say to people. Mm. Don't even have to tell it, but yeah, it's yours. Yeah. Take control of your story. It's yours. Mm. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Piers. It's really nice to talk to you. Yeah. And thank you so much for your work. What powerful work you're doing, you know, going into prisons and secure unit. And soon, hopefully, to work with ex-borders. It's interesting. Robert Bly talks about that, that, you know, often um, in I and John saying that often that's what our gift is to the world is where our deepest wound has been. And that's why, for me, I'm so passionate about bringing light to boarding school because of what i went through at boarding school um so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm, but thank you thank you been a real pleasure speaking to you thank so you please do people get in touch or go and visit his website watch his films and uh yeah good luck with uh, the projects as they move forward and my contact details are on my website so you can contact me through that great Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very okay. much, Tony. Thank you, Piers. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye.